A very warm welcome to all of you. Um, now we start the second part of this um, day. And um, the title is Global Berlin in the 21st Century. We're going to start with some welcome addresses. I welcome the Staatssekretärin, the Permanent Secretary of Higher Education Research and Gender Equality at the Senate Department for Higher Education and Research, Health, Long-Term Care and Gender Equality in Berlin, a very long title. Welcome Mrs. Amagan Najipur. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And Ahlan wa Sahlan, dear Professor Lepper, dear Professor Dorgolo, esteemed members of Agia, distinguished guests. I am delighted to welcome you to an evening that will showcase the major highlights of the interdisciplinary AGIA research projects. And I am sure everyone's uh, also especially looking forward to a panel discussion with high-ranking Arab and German representatives from Berlin's political, academic and cultural landscape. Well, we are delighted to be hosting this first bilateral Young Academy worldwide. The Arab-German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities is based at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities and at the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology in Egypt. It was founded in 2013. Argue promotes research collaborations between excellent academics from a wide range of disciplines, and it promotes and secures the internalization of Berlin as a center of science and research in the Arab region. Why? Well, Argue offers a unique opportunity to attract outstanding scientists from the Arab world, and it promotes Berlin's cultural and academic significance in the Arab world, a region that has become deeply intertwined with the everyday life of the inhabitants in this city, gladly, especially those who have recently decided to make Berlin their new home. This fits the spirit of our city, which aims to be an open, distinctly international metropolis. And this evening, I would especially like to welcome every participant here in this room, also online, with an Arabic background. Your special expertise on collaborative research projects for the specific needs of the city of Berlin truly broadens and enriches our perspectives. Thank you very much for that. In 2021, Agia realized the research project entitled Global Berlin in the 21st century. The aim of this project is to promote a new interdisciplinary view on Berlin based on various research perspectives from the humanities and the social sciences, as well as engineering and health sciences. The research focused on Berlin topics ranges from smart mobility to concepts of urban health. It spans strategies of cultural education in the digital age to Arab perspectives on transformation processes shaping our city. The research project was conducted with renowned Berlin institutions such as the Humboldt University of Berlin, the Technical University of Berlin, the Charité, the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, as well as with Agia members and alumni from the Arab region. As a hotspot for higher education and research, Berlin is an ideal setting for this kind of international cooperation. I would like to take this opportunity also to thank the Federal Ministry of Education and Research for securing the basic funding for Agia. And I'm very pleased that despite, we know it all, the enormous pressure on all departments to streamline uh, our budgets here in Berlin, we have managed to finance the project Global Berlin in the 21st century with state funding. With the support of the Berlin Senate, Agia was able to implement important research projects and to expand existing cooperations between Berlin's institutions internationally. You have engaged in diverse topics such as health and happiness, Arab perspective on living environment in larger cities, urban smart mobility concepts in Berlin, Arab perspective on transformations in Berlin, 
papyrus to Twitter, new forms of museum presentations in a digital age. And I'm sure that it was a very ambitious goal to realize these projects despite the challenges posed by us on us by the pandemic. Many thanks, dear Professor Lepper, for your tireless efforts. I'm looking forward to future developments and hopefully to a bright future of collaborations. Believing in research as the genesis of insights and knowledge of science, innovation and against the background of our own history and in view of current challenges, we are firmly committed to open and free science and research. Berlin is a city of freedom. Berlin supports and protects the freedom of thought and debate, as well as the competition for good ideas. Like no other location, I would say, our city attracts students and researchers from all over the world. And like no other location, Berlin benefits from exactly this outstanding internationality and cosmopolitanism. Higher education and research have helped to make our city a success for more than 200 years now. Academic interaction on a regional, national, and on an international level creates progress, which in turn enables synergy effects that are helping to move Berlin further on its path to become a global capital of knowledge and innovation. And in today's digital era, the interaction between higher education, research, business creates, of course, great opportunities. In my position as Permanent Secretary for Higher Education, Research and Gender Equality, I always like to focus on that part too, we have made it our goal to strengthen the importance of gender and diversity in higher education and research. One thing is clear to us, diversity is essential in our quest for the best solutions to complex problems, be it the diversity of perspectives and the diversity of backgrounds. Distinguished guests, we know that we are facing unprecedented global challenges at the moment, but Berlin is determined to continue to shape science and research policy actively in the coming years to face these challenges together as part of a global community. I would like to thank the staff of Argya for organizing tonight's event, and I wish you all an insightful evening from the project presentations and inspiring panel discussion later on, and for those visiting on short term, uh, a very pleasant stay in Berlin. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice opening. Um, we will continue with the next welcome address of Professor Dr. Hartmut Dorgelo. He's the General Director of the Humboldt Forum. Thank you for having us here. Um, and the Chairman of the Board of the Humboldt Forum Foundation at the Berliner Schloss. The floor is yours. Dear Madam Permanent Secretary, liebe Professorin Lepper, esteemed members of AGIR, dear colleagues and partners, friends, it's a great pleasure and it's a privilege for me to welcome you here at, uh, to the Humboldt Forum in person or even online. I hope you will have the opportunity soon to come to Berlin and to visit also this place because it's the newest landmark here in the historical center of Berlin. And it's not only a place to visit, but it's also a place to discuss because it's also a very controversial and uh, very emotional place for many of us who have a long history with the Humboldt firm. But perhaps there are some other um, bonds between the ideas and the goals of Aguirre and the Humboldt Forum. The Humboldt Forum wants to become a place for culture and science, for exchange and debate. The Humboldt Forum will become a space for open dialogue, not only for Berlin locals, but also for partners, for colleagues, for people who want to join, who want to contribute, want to become part of what we want to create here as a new forum 
for international dialogue in, as an international platform for dialogue and a place where we can learn from each other, where we can listen to each other, where we can share experiences and perspectives because we are convinced that it's better to talk together instead of talking about somebody else. So dialogue, I think, is also something that brings you together and sharing ideas, developing something in common. These are also goals of our work and perhaps there are also similarities and connections to your work and to your program. The multiplicity of voices is here also reflected in the institutional collaboration of our work. And that's why I'm so glad, Paul, that you are here. So you are heading one of our partners, the City Museum, as well as you, Lars, Lars Christian Koch, the director of the Ethnological Museum and the Museum of Asian Art, two of our major partners. And the third partner among us, our foundation, is the Humboldt University. So I can tell you that's also a new experience for us, sharing this new place and uh, something we have to learn how to manage it. That's one question, but also how to create something new, bringing our competences and our potentials together. Diversity is also a decisive foundation stone for working on thinking in the Humboldt Forum. And we stand for equal rights for all people and in all their diversity. It sees itself as a resonance space and a contact zone and a site for joint debates on cultural identities and global futures. And I think there are various reasons, very serious reasons to do this. I was born in Berlin um, and I spent half of my life in the eastern part because I grew up in East Berlin. And uh, so the second half of my life I spent until now in a reunited city. And I can tell you that's a very, very strange experience, not changing the city, but living in a complete dif uh, completely different world uh, for the last 30 years. This is not only one of the exciting uh, elements of being a Berliner, but it's also perhaps some, thing, uh, some, some reason why Berlin is a good place where you can discuss perspectives and future plans for the 21st century. And I can only congratulate you and all of you who are behind this program making that you are here to discuss Berlin's perspectives in the 21st century and not only Berlin's, but perhaps there's something we can learn from you and we can share and perhaps we can get some ideas perhaps also for the Humboldt Forum as one of the places in uh, Berlin, which are new here, to create an attractive program, not only for academics, but for a broader audience, because that's our, one of our main goals, how to create a kind of transformation, not only between the academic world, but between institutions, organizations like yours in collaboration or in contact with thousands of people who are coming along, perhaps as tourists, having no idea what's uh, going on behind this reconstructed facades. So I think there are many, many reasons why we are glad that you are here. And um, I hope that the bright minds of all of you will come again and that we can give a kind of inspiration to your work. And uh, we are looking forward what will happen next, perhaps also here in the Humboldt Forum with you. Thank you so much for coming. I wish you a very successful meeting here in the Humboldt Forum. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Professor Dr. Verena Lepper. She is um, from Agia, principal investigator and of the Mu Egyptian Museum and Papyrus Collection Berlin of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. The floor is yours.
Dear Madam State Secretary Naripur, dear Professor Dogalu, thank you very much, both of you, for your kind words of welcome here in Berlin, here in the Humboldt Forum, dear members of the Arab Diplomatic Corps, dear Mr. Dobis, as representatives of the BMBF, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, esteemed AGIA members and alumni, dear ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening on behalf of AGIA, the Arab-German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities, here in Berlin, in the Humboldt Forum, and you all out there online who will follow our event, as I heard with high numbers, via our YouTube channel today. Achlan wa Sachlan, good evening. Global Berlin in the 21st century, we celebrate this evening. A vision, a reality, a call. In Berlin, the vibrant city we all love, numerous Arab and German AG members and alumni work at a wide variety of research institutions and universities. There is not only a great deal of expertise, Berlin also plays a central role as a location for science and innovation in a global context. The interdisciplinary research on this city of knowledge from an Arab-German perspective has the potential to provide insights and valuable impulses to make Berlin an even more livable city with model character. Berlin is unique and a pioneer in pluralism and diversity with art and culture, with its discourses characterized by openness and particularly suitable for the Arab academic, academic exile community. Perspectives of Arab migrants and migrat migrant scholars as an example for the integration of migrants from other countries, like at the moment the Ukraine, should be mentioned here too. Thus, discussions on smart cities, health, renewable energy, post-colonial discourses, transformation are of utmost relevance in and for Berlin. Thanks to the Senate of Berlin, we are able to last year, we were able to realize highly relevant research with an Arab and German perspective on topics like health, transformation, mobility, and museums. In cooperation with the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences, with the Charité, with the Humboldt University, the Technical University, and the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. A variety of questions we raised here, like, how are Berlin and its recent or even past transformation processes perceived in the Arab world and by Arab residents and fellow citizens in Berlin? What can Berlin learn concerning concepts for mobility and health from our Arab partners? How can new presentation formats be developed in museums today from Arab and German perspectives? The diversity of knowledge production is always embedded in a global context. Thus, our AGIA members understand themselves as cultural and scientific ambassadors and diplomats. We would like to thank today all project partners in this endeavor, both in Berlin and in the Arab world, who made this research possible. The Berlin office of AGIA, I wish to thank for all their support, including Sabine Dorpmüller and especially Melanie Schreiber. We are particularly grateful to Professor Dorgalo including his board with Professor Koch and Paul Spies, for the opportunity of presenting our research highlights in such a spectacular and historically relevant and important venue in the midst of Berlin. As, as I said it, as the new intercultural meeting hub. Here, I wish to thank also the organizing team at the Humboldt Forum, for Kopf and for Tietze, and all the magicians behind the scenes who make this event possible. We are extremely grateful to the Senate of Berlin, to the State of Berlin, for funding the research on global Berlin in the 21st century. This funding was and is important for the strategic development of AGIA. The team at the Senate around the State Secretary, Amarkan Naripur, Frau koch Unterseer, Frau Schneider, Frau Hoffmann, I wish to thank following our vision and mission for and of AGIA. AGIA itself, is funded by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research since its very beginning, and Herr Dobis, representing the BMBF, is kindly present here today as well. We are very happy that AGIA is based with its office here in Berlin. And let's work together on 
to continue our joint vision and mission for Agia in a sustainable manner. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, you might be wondering, what is Agia? the Arab-German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities. 23 countries, one mission. Agia connects excellent scholars from countries like Algeria, Bahrain, Comor, Djibouti, Egypt, Germany, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, Oman, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, Tunisia, the United Arab Emirates and Yemen. Agia's mission is to bring together excellent Arab and German scholars to address shared challenges and develop solutions through research cooperation. So what is Agia in brief? Established in 2013 as the first bilateral young academy. The members are early career scholars, so three to ten years after their PhD, affiliated with a research institution either in Germany or any Arab country from all fields of research, so natural science, life science, social science, technical science, humanities and the arts, selected in a highly competitive selection process for five years of membership. Currently, we have a bit more than 60 members and 55 alumni affiliated with over 80 prominent universities and research institutions. So after five years of membership, you do become an alumnus or alumna and you're part of a lifelong family network. English is the working language of Agia. And in relation to the format and content of its academic activities, Agia is independent. The interdisciplinary research is the particular goal and part of the objectives. So to realize innovative interdisciplinary research projects, but also capacity building and promotion of high potential. So the in in initiation of projects at the interface of science and, and society is here in the fore. Research-oriented policy advice, the implementation of transnational initiatives on questions of education, research and science policy. The network building and scientific cooperation is important for us. The establishment of Arab-German, but also Arab-Arab collaborative projects to work on problems across borders. We have a very strong advisory board that supports us, that helps us to select the bright minds internationally. With members here based in Berlin at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy, the president, so Herr Markschies, or the president of the Leopoldina, Herr Hauck, Frau Lenz, for Goethe, Herr Pachtsinger for the SPK, Herr Mukachi for the DART, and several Arab partners from all regions of the Arab world. The Agia administration and the funding we should briefly summarize. So we do have our main Agia office in Berlin, based in the Jägerstraße at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences, the BBAW. We do have a regional office in Cairo, based at the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology. And we also have regional coordinators in Berlin, in Beirut and in Tunis. The funding, as I said, is mainly coming from the BMBF, the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, and from the Senate Chancellery, Higher Education and Research, several Arab and German partners, and more to come. The working groups and research formats, like Arab and German education, common heritage, dynamics of transformation, energy, water and environment, health and society, but also innovation. This is the output, so a lot of publications and while you're mingling later on at the reception, you do have a chance to collect some of the books we prepared here at the entrance of our venue so that you can see what diverse city is kind of scheduled in the Agia activities and what the outputs are. We're also present at the MS Wissenschaft at the moment. Last week we went onto the water with a station of Agia. We have a large public engagement at the Salon Sophie Charlotte, for example, opening on the 21st of May here in Berlin at the BBAV. So please welcome. We also have Agia exhibitions at special venues like the Neues Museum in Berlin. Communication channels. Those of you online are using them already. So the YouTube channel. We have a digital newsletter. Please register. 
And you can follow us via Facebook and Twitter, and of course, our wonderful new Agya website. Images, however, say more than simply words. So I'd just like to call up the film. Action, please. Agia, the Arab-German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities, is the first bilateral young academy worldwide. More than 50 members, an equal number of Arab and German scholars, have been selected to join Agia since 2013. Hello, my name is Hanan Badr. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Communication and Media Studies at Freie Universität Berlin. My name is Oliver Korn. I'm a professor for human-computer interaction at the University of Offenburg. I am Tarek Tafik, an Egyptologist based in Cairo. My name is Mohammed Abulanein. I'm a junior professor at Charité Berlin. My name is Ahmed Al Gindi. I am an associate professor of mathematics here at Texas and I'm at Qatar. My name is Verena Lepper. I am an Egyptologist here in Berlin at the National Museums. My name is Jan Völkel. I'm a political scientist at Cairo University and I'm a proud member of Agia. I'm a member of Agia. I'm an Agia member. I am happy to be an Agia member. I'm a proud member of Agia. Agia brings together excellent Arab and German scholars to face shared challenges and develop solutions through research cooperation across all disciplines. How can we preserve cultural artifacts? Agia members Verena Lepper and Abdallah El Bashir analyze archaeological finds in Sudan by means of chemical fingerprinting. So we're right in the middle of Naga here in northern Sudan and we're part of a field trip team which is run by Abdallah al-Bashir and me as members of Akia and uh, we're looking at different meroitic sites. What I find really unique about the project is that a chemist and an Egyptologist work together. So someone from the natural sciences and the humanities and we would probably not have work together without Agia and would not have had the opportunity to develop this project. Social robots replacing humans in healthcare and domestic work. What do young academics in Arab countries and Germany think about this? Agia member Oliver Kahn looks into this question. He conducts a comparative study with the support of his fellow Agia members. Social robots are robots which help us in different areas, for example, healthcare or as personal assistants. So I wanted to find out how do the views and the acceptance of these social robots differ in various cultures. And of course, Agia is the ideal platform for testing it out. How can we improve healthcare for Syrian refugees in Germany? Agia member Mohammed Albul Ainain prepares policy recommendations together with the Agia Working Group on Health and Society. My project is a study on the perception of healthcare access for refugees in Germany. I'm fine, how are you doing? I do this project with other members because then they can bring in their ideas about social science and how the socio-economic factors impact the life of refugees. How can we attract high school students to mathematics? Agia member Ahmed El Gindi organizes math camps for young talents with German and Qatari trainers in Doha. High school students, they have many talents that they themselves may not recognize. And we need to try to give them the chance to find their strengths and develop them. The most rewarding thing is when you see the students eagerly working on a problem and having this focus in their eyes and in their brain and you kind of you know, see a bright future whenever you see them. Akia offers a lot of benefits. Of course, we get some research grants for uh, proposals that we can develop ourselves. The networking possibility is fabulous. You meet directly people, you discuss with them, and it's not like writing an email or something like that. 
I have um, met wonderful scientists from other disciplines like chemistry, medicine and of course uh, political science. So it really enriches my own portfolio, my own knowledge and my own contacts. And with time, you have the impression that you are a member of family. Together we have tackled issues and questions that are relevant to our society and we would go beyond the ivory towers of academia. So what makes the Agia team great is the interdisciplinary and the motivation to change things into a better way. Agia opens perspectives. Agia opens the world. Find out more about Agia on agia.info. Today, you visited already the exhibition Berlin Global here in the Humboldt Forum as part of our program. In addition, you had an unusual perspective on our city visiting the rooftop of this building, having a view from above. After our welcome addresses, you will hear now about the highlights of the research project Global Berlin in the 21st century, presented by Arab and German AGIA members and alumni. We start with Philip Blechinger from the project Urban Smart Mobility Concepts in Berlin. At the Technical University, we continue then about the topic health and happiness, Arab and German perspective on living environments in larger cities with Professor Hegazi from the Charité. Then Hanan Badre, um, together with Nahed Samur, they will continue to discuss about Arab perspectives on transformation processes in Berlin based at the Humboldt University, and then Papyrus to Twitter, new forms of museum presentations in the digital age, uh, based at the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. And I will give you a small glance um, as alumna of Agia. Afterwards, a panel discussion with eminent experts would follow, focusing on Berlin Global, Global Berlin, Berlin Global, Global Berlin, including Paul Spies as chief curator of the Berlin Global exhibition here in the Humboldt Forum, Felix Kreuzig as the smart mobility expert in Berlin, based at the Technical University. Fadi Abdel Nur, who can report from his own experience living in Berlin and running an Arab bookshop and film festival. And Sharp El Beshraoui as global health expert based at the RKI, an institution we all know very well here in Berlin. Afterwards, we invite you all to our networking dinner, where you have the chance and opportunity to share views in individual conversations. Berlin, dear ladies and gentlemen, can learn from the world and the world can learn from Berlin. So let's start with the highlights of global Berlin in the 21st century. And I ask Philipp Blechinger to come onto the stage. I wish us all an inspiring evening and a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Good evening, and first of all, thank you, Verena, for inviting me and us as a project team. Thank you to Agia, and um, thanks to the Senate Chancellery of Higher Education and Research, and I'm especially happy that the um, Secretary is here, because um, you might not know it yet, but the transport research has a lot to do with gender as well. And this um, we will see in the next 15 minutes, our project, our sub-project of this um, Global Berlin in the 21st century is called Urban Smart Mobility Concepts. And I would like to thank my project's partners, Jamal Genuri from Algeria, and especially Sakia Sumaro, who's just joining online. Hi, Sakia. She's currently doing a fellowship at the Joe Biden School of Policy at the University of Delaware. So I'm very glad about this hybrid event. And um, what problems have we looked at? As a researcher, first you identify the problems. And um, problems in urban um, transport systems are that these systems are car-centered, and this means they are polluting, expensive, and exclusive. And I get back to this because it excludes half of the population sometimes, which is the female part. 
and they create congestion. Public transport is often unsafe and unreliable, and the planning focuses on infrastructure for cars, and unfortunately not for the people. And these are just the words, but let's look at this picture here. We see that the answer to the problems of congestion is usually just adding another lane, giving more space to the car, but it just creates more traffic. So we should keep this in mind. We need alternative solutions. And how can we find these solutions? And here comes Agia into play. As a researcher, we can do energy system modeling, we can do simulations, but we can also do empirical research. And the best in this case is to ask people who make experiences and who share, who share these experiences and help us to find ideal solutions. So our goal was to investigate these uh, sustainable or smart mobility concepts in Berlin, but also in Arab cities. And again, that's, that's the leverage of Agia to have access to these cities in a very direct way. And um, the approach was to, do an, um, to find these cities and then analyze and evaluate concepts. And the concepts we translate more as civil society organizations, initiatives who work from a bottom-up perspective in changing the cities towards more sustainable transport. And the approach we took is we conducted uh, interviews, but uh, the main part was an interactive workshop. And uh, based on this workshop, we developed a publication in an e-paper format, and I will give you more insights on that. First, um, what was the workshop about? So, and we managed to, to get 50 different uh, inter, even transdisciplinary stakeholders in an online format to join and to share experiences. And um, we conducted this via um, three major um, agenda points. One was impulse lectures, keynotes from the policy side. We had uh, Susanne Menge, a member of the German parliament, and we had Felix Kreuzig, who will uh, speak later as well. Um, we had representatives um, from the research side in, in, in the Arab world, uh, Lilia Maklufi, and we had also uh, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation presenting from Amman. And then we took a change in the perspective and uh, we collected the perspectives of different initiatives, and I will present them as well and then had um, interactive workshops helping us to derive recommendations based on joint problems we see in Berlin, but we also see in Arab cities, but also see differences and see how we can learn from each other. And the first thing we asked the participants is, how do you envision uh, an urban mobility transition? And we see that um, Aside from car-centered, people mentioned, for example, human-centered, they wanted to have it sustainable, but even more important, safe, diverse. Yeah? Transport uh, is connected to many emotions. Everyone needs transport, so it's, it's always interesting to do research on transport systems and mobility. And the question is now, how do we achieve this vision? And again, what we did is we asked the people who are working on it. And I will just do now a very quick run through all the interesting initiatives and give you at the end of the presentation a direct hint where you can find the detailed results in our e-paper. So I will start with Sadaka. And here um, I want to address you again because this is an initiative which is especially gender sensitive. And parts of their work relate to labor rights and, and other topics, but one part is a transport. And, and a very crucial question is how to do gender sensitive transport planning and implement measures. And um, here we found a perfect example how this can be improved. And um, one example is uh, encouraging at a girl's age bicycle use. Another example is um, the last mile from public transport, which is usually felt the most unsafe one. How can we make this? more safe, install street lights, make, make the um, public transport stations more safe, 
that uh, the usage of public transport is a comfortable usage for all genders. And this is very much in line with uh, your coalition partner, I would say, in the, or with, um, with the, um, on, on the, on the federal level, with, with the Green Party, when uh, Susanne Menge, and I can quote her here, a feminist approach differs from the narrow view in planning and building that most people have. It does not only, it does not focus exclusively on technical solutions. We focus on accessibility, safety, and social justice. And then she refers to our workshop, and I'm proud to quote it. <laughs> this event captured this perspective perfectly and helped us to understand different challenges at different places and to learn from each other. And of course, we had initiatives from Berlin, and you might have heard one of them. It's called Keats Blocks, Changing Cities. So this is a civil society organization uh, which wants to achieve this city layout. So block the through traffic from the districts, from the Keats, which is a quarter, like a, a district in Berlin, and make this uh, more friendly for walking, for cycling, and uh, have a higher quality of living in these districts. Another initiative presented is called Parkplatz Transform. They have this um, citizen science approach, people map parking space, and then they create this amazing maps where you just show how much space we waste for vehicles instead of using it for people. And so it shows that um, data is important, but also how you use the data. And this refers back to what researchers can do. So now we changed the country. We had three initiatives from Cairo. One's called Tabdeal. And again, here, gender played an important role. Um, their focus was um, safe infrastructure for cycling. And it was not Tabdeal, but um, Sigetak Kadara, who said, like the initiative, the representative said that 99% of the cyclists are male in Egypt or in Cairo. And these both initiatives work on changing this. Kadara, they do like trainings. They encourage bicycle use for all genders from an early age on. And, and you see like this, I mean, these are the events they do and, and it's maybe compared comparable to the critical mass in Berlin, but it's, I think it's, it has a much higher need and impact in this city. And Tabdil focused more on um, creating uh, the, the infrastructure in a way, giving advice to policy and planning. And the same is Transport for Cairo. They have a more data-driven approach. And I think from all of them, we can learn that um, it is important uh, to encourage the people to use different modes of transport and the ways could be offering trainings. I mean, you need to feel safe on a bicycle, offering infrastructure. We also talked about the pop-up bike lanes, which have been in, 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 in massive, which created a massive positive impact on cycle, bicycle use in Berlin and other cities. It was inspired by Bogota. It doesn't fit into the Arab cities, but we also invited them to the workshop. And then we also looked at initiatives from Beirut. This one is called Riders Rides. And what they do is they improve the informal public transport. So you can imagine a city which runs only in, on an informal public transport without schedules, without official timetables. And they just digitalize it. They just track the routes and they offer now like on top of these informal services, an open, uh, open timetable, open map on where the routes are, where are the services. And of course, this is an, an, a massive improvement for accessibility and uh, user friendliness. And then we have Shankaboot from Ramallah. And here we see the um, transition from, um, from, from combustion engines to, to electric vehicles. So what they do is a, it's a delivery service which focuses especially on sustainable modes of transport. And here what we see in the picture is an, uh, uh, an e-bike, which is used for, for these transport modes. So 
and uh, we will we will hear him directly. But still, I, I would like to quote um, Felix Kreuzig on um, the academic perspective we also had in this workshop, and he said that avoid and shift approaches are crucial. And I guess not everyone is familiar with the concept of avoid, shift, and improve in the um, transport systems research. Avoid means avoiding traffic, so reduce the need for transport. And shift is mainly shifting from car usage to public transport and to uh, bicycle walking. While improve is shift or improving the efficiency of the transport mode, which is usually refer to combustion engines should um, become electric vehicles. But if you remember the, uh, the drawing from the beginning, if you have congestion with combustion engine, uh, with, with, uh, with conventional vehicles, or you have a congestion with e-mobility, of course, it's a bit nicer to breathe the air, but you're still stuck in traffic. So that's why we said avoid and shift approaches are crucial and underestimated for a successful transformation of the transport sector. And we need more discussion and exchange on what approaches have worked and can be replicated. And again, I probably quote about the workshop. The workshop and its results are a wonderful example of how to do this. And here it's summarized. So again, we see the avoid, shift, improve. And um, our main focus is recommending avoid measures so what's, for example, called short distance cities and mixed neighborhoods. So that you don't have a pure residential area and then you need to take your car to go for grocery shopping, like you find in the US in these uh, planned out um, broad cities. Um, remote, remote work and meetings. I don't need to talk about this since we have experienced this for two years. It's nice to be here. But it's also nice that we do not need to fly everyone in. Uh, so it's good that we also make it accessible via the YouTube channel. Shared mobility concepts. So not everyone needs to own a car, a bicycle, an e-scooter. And um, of course, infrastructure is needed um, to, to encourage uh, walking and cycling. And then... Um, on the shift side, there can also be some painful measures. We want to encourage people to shift away from cars. A very high number of trips, or like the, the, the percentage of the, of the kilometers driven, is just based on looking for parking space. And now you could say, conventional approach, create more parking space, makes this more comfortable, but the only thing what is happening is more people drive and then they look again for a limited parking space. If you limit the parking space, if you reduce it, you will create a mind shift. You will make this an uncomfortable mode of transport. And then the alternatives become more attractive. So it's not only about making, um, creating the alternatives, for example, for public transit, a transport to make this more safe, more accessible, more affordable, but also to make the conventional approach a bit less comfortable. And we learned, in, especially in the international perspective, but also we see that this is successful in Germany, is training and awareness raising for cycling. I still remember I got this certificate in third grade that I was a sufficient bicycle user. I'm not sure if I still have it, but I still use my bicycle. Today I came, it was safe, it was good. And then on the improved side, just that this electrification of transport should focus on also the public fleets and um, should go in line with, with shared mobility as well. And the initiatives uh, who joined the workshop, who gave the interviews, who, who helped us creating these recommendations, these are drivers for this. Community engagement and bottom-up initiatives are drivers for this change. And of course, this is embedded in a political environment policies, planning, and regulations. And this is all needed to achieve this vision, what I've shown in the beginning on sustainable urban mobility. And the final conclusion by Katja Deal, who was moderating this event is, it was a pleasure to moderate this event and to learn about the diversity and variety of initiatives working towards sustainable urban mobility in the cities.
Especially the international comparison opened up many new and inspiring perspectives. I look forward to a continued exchange and increasing network of initiatives showing the way forward to just, inclusive and sustainable mobility. And this is the final product. We created this policy paper, um, which helps, should help uh, to create this way towards a sustainable mobility future. And taking sustainability very seriously, we now have not printed 20 or 100 versions of a 60 page paper. No, we created an e-paper. And now I would like to uh, invite the, um, the technic room here to um, open the e-paper. And what I will distribute later on is this QR codes. So where you can just, with your smartphone, um, scan and then you are directly um, uh, you directly see this paper and it's basically an inter and pdf but it's interactive and so there's the title page and here you see the content it's not new for you anymore because this is what i just have presented but uh, of course here you will find all the details we have the keynote lectures we have uh, the initiatives and we have the recommendations and i want to uh, bring your attention to a special highlight. So if you look at one of the keynote lectures, and um, again, we take the example of um, Susanne Menge, you see this familiar um, icon, which directs you to a YouTube video. So when you look at this paper, you have the opportunity to re-watch uh, the keynote lectures, but even more important, sorry to say this for the keynote speakers, the initiatives as well. And so this is the e-paper. Address me later on at the reception, get your QR code. And um, maybe going back to the presentation, I really would like to thank the research team. As I said, Sakia in the US, but uh, my Alba Tat, she's here. You can also talk to her. She um, especially helped us uh, making the connections to the Arab cities, uh, Peter Weimüller and uh, Felix. And then um, again, thanking Agia and for the funding, the Senate Chancellery of Higher Education and Research Berlin. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, I'm happy now to invite my Agia colleague, Ahmed Igazi from Charité, uh, presenting your research. Thank you. Um, so, um, um, it's my pleasure today to present our AGIA project, uh, Health and Happiness, uh, Arab-German Perspectives uh, on Living Environments in Larger Cities. Uh, this is a project that was spearheaded by Mohammed al Qatan in Kuwait and uh, myself. Um, it was a project that uh, was initiated where we were interested to investigate how urban health and well-being um, um, is um, seen um, and um, um, felt from both Arab and German sides. And we actually um, thought in, um, to consider this uh, idea and to think about it in an in interdisciplinary uh, manner, which is one of the strengths that we have within our AGIA uh, community. And there we asked um, several questions, and one of the questions that we had we were, was, how can we make a city life healthier, uh, more social, um, and happier? Um, and we were wondering, because of the majority, and all the AGIA members actually are scientists, is, if there is a scientific formula um, for a happy city, or what we called an, a happy, happy, happy opolis. Um, and we thought of ideas and concepts and solutions that might be actually developed in both Arab and German metropolises. Um, and uh, we thought if we can maybe exchange ideas and um, think of each other. Of course, the background is clear that according to the Federal Ministry of Economic, uh, for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, BMZ, that 80% um, of the world's population is ex expected to live in cities by 2050. Um, and of course, we know the problems of cities. Uh, first, we have our noise, air pollution, uh, potential overcrowding, urban heating, um, islands, and greater stress. And uh, we were thinking how could we 
basically transform this kind of environment toward a more healthier um, and to an environment that promote well-being and quality of life. And the outcome of our discussion was basically we decided to make a science-based podcast that we called Happyopolis. So Happyopolis is basically a science-based podcast series uh, with both Arab and German uh, AGIA members and alumni, um, as well as invited experts for different, um, from different uh, disciplinary backgrounds. The podcast tackles a variety of themes uh, relevant to urban life and also city-specific uh, in a way. And each episode focuses on a specific Arab or German city, um, revolves around a particular theme, um, and uh, usually two guests are um, involved in the discussion. And we have additional um, speakers, uh, which we call telephone jo uh, jokers, uh, that cont can contribute to the podcast and usually last between 30 to 45 uh, minutes. Speakers are urban planners, architects, positive psychologists, uh, public health and sustainability experts, engineers, um, artists, policymakers, and more. Um, and our audience is, um, um, is academic community, of course, uh, policymakers and people who are interested from all around the world about this um, topic. And we were very glad to win uh, Dr. Louise Lambert, um, who is a registered psychologist um, and a professor with more than 20 years of experience in counseling and mental health and higher education and research and primary health care. She's an expert in positive um, psychology. She's the founder and editor of the Middle East Journal of Positive Psychology. Um, and she's the head of uh, happiness programming and policy design within happinessmatters.org. Um, and she herself lived uh, in uh, United Arab Emirates for more than 10 years um, with experience in um, teaching in this uh, topic. And together with her then and the Arab colleagues and the German colleagues, um, we actually ident identified certain cities uh, within Germany and different Arab countries, uh, which are listed here. And based on uh, each city, uh, we had basically certain um, focus. Um, so we had Berlin, so we, um, is a city where I myself are living and working in it, um, have been my center of my life now for uh, the last uh, 20 years. And uh, we, there we have been scouting certain uh, aspects like urban stress. And of course, uh, Berlin was interesting because of the kind of uh, political interest in this kind of Berlin health city, 2030. Um, we also were um, interested in Kuwait City. There, there were concepts about vocability, uh, obesity, increasing physical health. Hamburg, of course, as a harbor city, offers different challenges. Um, and of course, blue spaces. Uh, and Cairo, my home city where I was born, basically, um, of course, and we heard from the last uh, project, is basically how traffic and congestion and noise pollution actually affect people um, and how urban design can actually be uh, relevant there and how mobility and especially the new capital that has been currently built and uh, promoted uh, could actually um, influence uh, the dynamics there. We have also Munich, uh, known for its green spaces, its architect and climate, and how climate res resilience is relevant there. In Algiers, social housing, heritage, and maintaining identity with the topics that we are um, dealing with. Tunis, focus on female well-being in urban spaces. Um, Jeddah, about um, there we were focusing on technology and architect um, and climate change as well as art, and. Berlin um, is a quite a relevant city and a city where actually, as I mentioned, there is a lot of political interest uh, in promoting health and also because of the Charité, uh, one of our perspective uh, 2030 in the Charité is actually rethinking health. I think the last decade uh, and several, uh, maybe several decades, we're focusing on factors that promote disease. Um, so a bacteria infection or a virus can let us get sick. But the interesting thing that we're actually interested in now in the Charité is basically 
what actually maintain our health, right? And um, this is the, the state that is actually the most important state. It's not the disease. The disease is an exceptional situation. And there, actually, uh, we were able to uh, talk uh, with uh, Frau Ulrike Gotte, um, Berlin, uh, Berlin's Senator for Higher Education and Research, Health and Long-Term Care and Gender Equality, also Professor uh, Master Adli. Um, he's an expert uh, in uh, stress um, and uh, also um, a research group leader within the Charité and myself. Um, and uh, I would invite you to listen uh, together with me to the uh, kind of a sneak uh, peek to, uh, into our podcast. Happy Opolis, a podcast about urban health and well-being in the Arab world and Germany. How can we make city life healthier, more social, and of course, happier? Is there a scientific formula for a happy city? And can cities be compared, no matter on which continent you find yourself? In each episode of Happy Obelis, we'll be featuring cities across the Arab world in Germany, from Berlin and Munich to Cairo and Tunis. Why these cities? You'd be surprised just how many ideas for a happy and healthy city life they've developed solutions that are worth discovering and transferring to your own community. So join me on this podcast to hear members of the Arab-German Young Academy of Sciences and Humanities, AGIA, and invited experts as they share their research and innovative solutions. I'm Dr. Louise Lambert, your host, and welcome to Happyopolis. <music> Our first podcast in this series is about buzzing and busy Berlin and stress, the kind that comes from living in a dense and still growing city. Berlin has been shaped by its history, of course, but also by its longstanding residents as well as visitors. Today, Berlin is a global magnet for artists, scientists, as well as entrepreneurs. It is famous for its food from all over the world alternative arts and music scene, diverse lifestyles, and let's not forget, it's a legendary nightlife. At the same time, it also offers natural oases with more than 2,500 green spaces and parks, as well as hundreds of kilometers of cycling trails, allowing residents to get around peacefully. It is home to over 3.5 million people and is known for its welcoming nature and gruff charm. Yet, like many globalizing cities, it keeps changing. Rents are increasing, real estate is becoming more exclusive, and many residents are being displaced through gentrification. As more and more people call Berlin home, it is quite simply getting packed. More cars, traffic, crowded public transportation, as well as noise, garbage, and pollution. It's having an impact on public safety as well as the environment. Often called a permanent construction site, tensions sometimes rise. This brings new challenges for mental health, quality of life, and subjective well being. In fact, evidence shows that social stress and other urban stressors lead to a higher risk of mental illness, like depression and anxiety, which raises several questions. Can we better protect the mental health and well being of residents by minimizing stress factors? Well, Berlin has become a hot spot in the scientific study of urban stress and healthy cities. In fact, it's our topic today. I truly believe that Berlin is doing a great job um, by promoting physical activity and exercise, um, of course, and also especially um, the bike lanes. Um, there have been a lot of change, um, which actually we now really appreciate. And I'm sure that uh, my Agia colleague, uh, Dr. Mohammed Katan, uh, who is a professor um, at the, um, for phys physical education um, in Kuwait, would agree on this. And he, in his um, um, podcast, elaborated 
how basically during the lockdowns, how political decision to lock down the city for two hours um, to reduce basically or to promote the physical exercise um, of the uh, um, of the um, inhabitants uh, promoted actually the idea of physical health and physical activity. Um, and uh, together with other uh, members uh, in this episode, um, as Her um, Highness uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Intisar Al Sabah, as well as uh, Professor uh, Saud Al Khalid and um, Mohammed, my colleague, and Ahmed uh, Shakriya, um, they discussed possible kind of ideas how could actually um, physical, uh, promoting physical um, activity would be relevant uh, for a city like Kuwait. And I would invite you here to also to listen to a kind of a sneak peek into to, uh, this podcast. In today's podcast, we join you from Kuwait City, the capital of Kuwait. Most people associate this nation of just 3 million with the war for oil almost 30 years ago. But it's moved on since then. Today, the rebuilt city is extended along much of Kuwait Bay, a section of the country's 500-kilometer crystal-clear coastline where you're likely to see jet skis, yachts, and fishing boats. It's also where the majority of the country, a range of global expatriates as well as Kuwaiti nationals, live. The city is home to modern skyscrapers, wide freeways, and luxury malls, as much as traditional markets. It also boasts a number of public and private universities. In fact, Kuwait University has the highest ranked faculty of clinical medicine in the region. And if you're looking for a night out, you'll find the region's largest opera house there too. But like many cities, it has grown at a rapid pace. Built for the car, given its high temperatures in the summer, over 50 degrees Celsius, footpaths for walking, public transportation, as well as the promotion of natural spaces have taken a back seat. This, alongside rapid modernization, has resulted in high rates of physical inactivity and obesity. In a country where 70% of the population is also under the age of 35, public health and city design are now a major part of the national agenda. Um, with this, I would like to thank you and uh, I would invite Professor Hanan Badr to present her uh, project. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, dear distinguished guests, dear uh, Agia family, I'm very happy to see many familiar faces here from Agia. It feels like a class reunion in a way, especially after two years of the pandemic. Um, uh, welcome to our part in the presentation today, where together with my colleague, uh, Akia uh, member, uh, Dr. Nahid Samour from Humboldt uh, Universität, and myself are uh, exploring the Arab perspectives on the transformation in Berlin. We're focusing on global Berlin, but also Berlin global. And let me share over the next few slides what we are doing exactly, or what we have been doing over the past uh, year and month. Uh, we have decided to go to the more classic approach in academia. We are both from humanities and social science, and we still think books matter. Uh, but we also believe that digital books and open access matters, as I will explain later. So we went for the book project Arab Berlin, Dynamics of Transformation. I'm very happy to uh, tell you that it will be published this year in September 2022, which is very fast for people from academia know how um, long books actually take to come out. And uh, it's been edited by Nahid and myself. Of course, you might wonder what Salzburg has to, uh, um, to be here or where it belongs. I've been in Berlin until very recently in the Freie Universität Berlin, and Berlin is still uh, the center of my life. Um, 
Why the book Arab Berlin? What, what, are, what is the main point of it and why do we need it? Now, first of all, as we all know in the room, in the past um, five to ten years, uh, Berlin is emerging as an intellectual hub um, of Arab intellectual life in Europe. Uh, many friends uh, call it uh, little Cairo, little Syria. We bump into each other in the roads in, uh, or in culinary centers or in even shopping streets or, of course, in universities and cultural. Um, exhibitions as well. So it's been emerging as a center for um, cultural, uh, Arab cultural life recently, and you probably all also see it as part of the increasing visibility in the streets um, and uh, of Arab academic, uh, cultural and economic productions in Berlin scenes, in Berlin's cultural scene as well as in the uh, even urban life. So we wanted to look at those evolving transformations with Arab German eyes, you know, as the Arab hyphen German says in the uh, Agia, and um, in, in multiple fields, from a trans transdisciplinary but also interdisciplinary conversation, the fields of migration, education, memory, studies and culture, security discourses, and also law, and even more, as I will um, um, describe later the parts of the book. And uh, we discover that Berlin is a mosaic, but we also want to go beyond that um, homogenized, um, romanticized picture. We want also to identify issues and contestations, uh, but also focusing on Arabs' agencies in particular. As I've said, the main theme is the evolving cultural scene and Arab intellectual life in Berlin. And we have here Fadi Abdunur, who will speak later. And you probably recognize some of the pictures as well, some of the initiatives he's a co-founder of, like Khan Al Janoub Bookstore, one of my uh, new favorite spots in, uh, in uh, I, I would almost have said in Cairo, where I originally come from. I meant to say Berlin, but that just shows how the hybrid identity is also part of our own biographies. Al Film Festival, which is a very successful and annual uh, film for Arab uh, movies. And also, um, I've mentioned that um, increasingly um, Arabs are changing also the streets. And this is where we um, highlighted or we have noticed that the initiative so that Berlin remains our homes, which is uh, against the gentrification and the rising uh, rent and um, yeah, basically pushing Berliners out into the outskirts is also even translated in Arabic because it also affects Arabs living in Berlin. And uh, this uh, pictures, the, all these pictures have been taken by um, the Egyptian photographer Iman Hilal, um, so that you also know um, where they come from. And yeah, Arab Berlin dynamics of transformation basically centers Arabs as Asians, subjects and objects of transformation in one of Europe's thriving metropoles. It brings Arab-German perspectives together in dialogue, in contestation, across the spectrum with also critical reflections. It argues beyond the binary constructions that we often see uh, in scholarship, either the romanticized uh, images and stereotypes or the securitized, criminalized discourses of Arabs um, in Europe. And this is why we think uh, that it is an innovative approach. Actually, if, when we started the research for this book, we found that it's almost non-existent. The texts Arab Berlin, or if, if you even Google them as, as a normal user beyond the scholarship, um, it's either culinary, so focusing on, on Google searches on Arab restaurants in Berlin, or Arab clans in Berlin. So we, we identified uh, like a spot here, a research gap, where we actually center the um, an Arab transformation beyond the Eurocentric perspective, beyond the binary perspectives I've just mentioned, and focusing on transformations that are happening within Europe. Not only looking at the Arab regions, the transformation from afar, but also transformation in the heart of Germany, in the heart of Europe. And this is why Arab Berlin also shifts the perspective epistemologically um, to Berlin as a hub. It fills a knowledge gap and enriches the discourse, both academically but also in the public discourse, with uh, the new, fresh perspectives. 
The transformations in Berlin in this book are considered through the spheres of politics, society and history, gender, demographics and migration, media and culture studies, but also education and research. We chose for this book, because I've highlighted the public role of scholarship as well beyond ivory towers, we chose for this book a kaleidoscopic approach, a kaleidoscopic character. Um, of course, you know that kaleidoscope, the toy maybe that some of us uh, played with or used with, that brings different assemblage of little colored pieces. And this is what we consider this book is. It is an assemblage, it is a curation of different formats that embraces different formats, not only academic language, accessible only to those who uh, um, work in the universities and um, research centers, but it contains the articles, as we know them, academic articles, but it also um, includes essayistic articles, shorter formats with polemic arguments and, and uh, um, um, shorter in word count. It also includes interviews, and it includes photo contributions all around the theme Arab Berlin. And therefore we see that this book also reflects critical encounters in Berlin from different perspectives and disciplines. I've mentioned the intra and transdisciplinary approach in the book. And indeed it covers uh, several disciplines. We're very happy to bring those different backgrounds and different perspectives or gazes together into the book from social sciences from humanities, but also natural science, including philosophy, history, Islamic and Arab studies, memory studies, linguistics, journalism and media studies, political science, sociology, medicine, science communication and law. So we identified that only like only through this inter and transdisciplinary discourse, we can actually cover also the full um, uh, spectrum of Arab intellectual life in Berlin. Evolving Berlin needs also to show us normal pictures of Arabs in their everyday life, you know, um, not only uh, in exotic and uh, securitized spaces, so in education, in urban architecture and design, but also in the classic niche, as we know, in the um, sweets and um, the food and street food market. The thematic clusters of the book reflect also that richness of perspectives we have. We have a cluster on higher education and international encounters in Berlin, especially that it's a magnet for international students. Um, we have a cluster on scholarly and cultural life from and on Berlin and beyond. Um, we have a focus on socioeconomic transformations in Berlin, for example, discourses on gentrification, street food, the changing uh, urban life in Berlin. We have perception of and by Arabs in contemporary, but also historic Berlin, especially with, with its rich and contested history. And we have also a cluster on exile, migration and belonging. For example, new beginnings, intellectual community, solidarity. We have also a cluster on inclusion, arts and activism in Berlin and beyond. For example, the connections between Black Lives Matter and Arabs in Berlin. The authors, uh, is a long list that was longer than the slide. Some of them are here in the room. Um, I've mentioned Fadi Abdenur, who will be sp speaking later. Julia Gerlach also contributed a chapter uh, to the book, who's been moderating. We have Sonia Hegazi from SETMO. We have also a number of AKIA members, whether based in Berlin or outside, like Amr Ali or Mohammed Al Wahib, but also Nadine Abdullah. Uh, Florian Kostal also uh, contributed here in the room. Uh, we also have non-AGIA members, as I've said, scholars, artists, experts based in and outside Berlin have been temporarily living in Berlin and moved back. So we have a richness of perspectives. Tal Heva, Iskandar Abdullah, Hashim El Ghaili, Naziha Said, Detlef Quintan, Miriam Stock, Mahmoud Dabdoub, um, and Christoph Dinkelager. Allow me to share with you an exclusive sneak peek 
This is how the book looks like. It's been already announced on the uh, publisher's webpage, and it is uh, um, in your hands, or can be in your hands already in September 2022. It will be published by the academic publisher Transcript Verlag within the series Urban Studies. It's in English language with support by the Arab German Young Academy of Science and Humanities, and of course, the Senate Chancellery for higher education, research, and uh, gender. Uh, we uh, are very careful to offer inclusive scholarship. Open access publication is a policy that we believe in as scholars, as an Agia, I know. And uh, you can find more details here on the transcript Verlag. We considered um, uh, printing out the flyers, but then again, also because we are environmentally con conscious, I uh, rather uh, um, yeah, show you the link and it's a PDF there that you will find. But let me also show, uh, use the last uh, minutes uh, to um, make some publicity for another event by Akia where there are synergy if, um, effects between the book Arab Berlin and uh, very, uh, the upcoming uh, event soon that Verena also mentioned in the introductions, which is the Lance Sophie Charlotte happening in 10 days on the 21st of May. Please save uh, the dates in your calendars where um, I am privileged to work also on a, another project with Agia called, it's a photo, photo exhibition, Biographies in Motion, the Arab Intellectual Community in Berlin, where I've worked together with a photographer, Iman Hilal, I've mentioned earlier. And um, there we uh, present stories and, and uh, biographies of uh, selected people and how they have made the shift and made a new beginning in Berlin. There it's more uh, another format of expression where it's more visual communication with short stories in the Paternoster. I really recommend the event, not only because I, I'm co-organizing it with the Agia office, but because it is really a very um, worthwhile uh, project for you. And it will be on a Saturday. So hopefully you would have the time as well. Having said that, thank you very much for your attention. And now I hand over to the next project, Verena, please. Yeah. Papyrus and Twitter is now. Yeah, thank you so much. The next project is entitled Papyrus to Twitter, New Forms of Museum Presentations in a Digital Age. And I speak here on behalf of uh, Tarek Taufik from Cairo University and from Melanie Schreiber, an Egyptologist based here in Berlin. Um, and we conducted this research project at the Egyptian Museum and Papyrus Collection um, in Berlin. And you see here sort of how our research developed, what kind of best practice examples we were looking at. This is kind of a collage of, of uh, the different um, presentation formats that we identified. So what is the project about? The topic was to investigate new forms of museum presentation in a digital age, particularly looking at the specific object literature. How does a museum present literature? Is literature boring? Are papyri boring? Is it a dry material? How can it be presented analog and digital? Which concepts exist internationally and what are the difficulties and challenges? What solutions are feasible and capable of development, especially in the digital age? The background is that we are increasingly having a rapid development of technological uh, details, growing influence of new or social media, the omnipresence of smartphones in our daily life, the necessity of adaptation of museological presentation formats to new formats and methods with techniques for and of museum education. Our Berlin cooperation partners in this project was the German Historical Museum, and Frau Lipowski is here today, the Humboldt University Berlin, the Free University Berlin, the Leibniz Center for Literatur- und Kulturforschung, and the main objectives were to identify 100 relevant Arab and German, as well as international museums and exhibitions 
in order to conduct a survey on museum experience among AGIA members and alumni. To develop an overview compendium and identify best practice examples for analog, digital and hybrid presentation formats, and thus exchange the ideas with AGIA and external experts about pre best practice examples. This we did and documented the results and observations in a trilingual book. It is in German, English and Arabic. And it is in preparation for print at the moment with Katmos Verlag. And again, it will appear in the course of this year. We are very happy that we are able to also publish this in an open access format. In addition to the book publication, we of course thought of further steps to develop a concept paper for future exhibitions built on these project results. And I will elaborate on this in a second. So what are the best practice examples that we looked at? Let's start in Sharjah, in the United Arab Emirates. We looked at the calligraphy museum. So here, the exhibition concept is that calligraphy is treated as art. Framed and displayed hanging on the wall. You might think this is more a traditional way. So we come from the um, more traditional to the hybrid format than to the digital formats. In Berlin, here in the Neuss Museum, in the Egyptian Museum and Papyrus Collection, we have for the papyri interactive showcases built in the so-called New Biedensaal that you can see here, where you press a button and um, uh, the museum showcases will, and the layers of the showcases will for, um, drive out. And you can see four layers so that you can choose which topics you would like to look at. So it's uh, not a digital format, but a more conventional way of displaying papyri. In the Museum Egizio in Torino, for example, we find different types of showcases of papyri where you can look on both sides. We call them the recto and the verso, so that you have a really inclusive uh, observation possibility or showcases where you have slightly angled the papyri and then um, a display of different topics and images and, and descri descriptions um, above. So these are best practice examples that we looked at. But also the Museum of Modern Literature in Marbach, in Germany, we looked at where we have movable round showcases with thematic sections, for example. And of course, it was difficult during COVID time to search all these exhibitions and all these museums. I mentioned we looked at more than 100 um, of them because obviously we could not travel to all of them and most of the museums were closed at some of the parts. So of course, we looked at what is digitally available to look how their displays look like. Let's go back to the Arab world. The Qatar National Library, of course, the main theme is books and literature, has a wonderful modern architecture, open spaces, technology, an exceptional setting, and we as Agia were proud enough to have an exhibition displayed there on Arab and German storytelling, so really showing literature, and it worked in these spaces extremely nicely. The same is true for the Louvre Abu Dhabi, for the in the United Arab Emirates for modern architecture and ex exhibition design, open spaces, contextualizing, for example, floor design, where you have a huge map on the floor where it's identified which collections all over the world contribute objects to the Louvre Abu Dhabi as the hotspot for arts in the Middle East at the moment. We also looked at the Rijksmuseum van Oudheden in Leiden where archaeology of the Netherlands is displayed, where there is a narrative architecture. You have kind of, you see this kind of wave uh, through the architecture, through the narrative um, of including both objects, both showcases, media stations, etc. So this is part of a best practice example that we could identify. Also, the House of History in Baden-Württemberg in Stuttgart where you have particularly scenographic designs where you can see here on the walls, individual tools are included so that you better understand what's happening and voices are told to you and sort of that they're more as an interactive component. At the Biblioteca Alexandrina, for example, we have this eye catcher. This is sort of to show you how books are like, but how books can also be used here as a unique book bench, for example. So entertaining, but also as a teaching tool. In New York at the David Chung studio, for example, we identified um, here an eye catcher by uh, Dav um, David Chung. Um, here, a paper as art and topic related, where we can see how 
um, this kind of shape um, uh, catches our eye. But also the Museum di Papiro in Syracuse in Italy we looked at, where a papyrus workshop is as a participatory element for visitors. So hands on, you make your own papyrus, you make your own plat and uh, interesting formats of practice of, of um, objects uh, themselves. At the Harvard Museum of Ancient Near East, uh, there is a life-size model with media stations here in construction of a village house from the Iron Age, where you have a media station where the texts who are told in the house are included. So again, how is literature combined in an exhibition and how can this be shown? In the same museum, we have a large stila. For example, it's the dreaming of the Sphinx. There, an augmented reality app was created so that you can actually use with your mobile phone to translate the text. This is a unique ensemble to translate the text so that you can actually um, uh, hear what the dreaming of the Sphinx was all about, but also um, the background information and um, uh, which pharaoh was uh, important in this whole uh, assemblage. In Germany, we have at the Egyptian Museum in Munich, for example, special showcases for papyri, including media stations that you can shift. So it's a mixture, it's a hybrid version um, for the Book of the Dead for several meters, and you can shift the media station with you so that each section can be translated and uh, um, identified and background information can be given. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, we found projections of original colors of texts on temple walls. Again, something very appealing. Also in Marbach, we found wall projections uh, supplementing showcases, for example, with punctuation marks, identifying contents of the individual showcases. I could, of course, go on and on here from the German Historical Museum. The exhibition actually was called Von Luther bis Twitter. And this was inspiring us, papyrus to Twitter, to look at media stations, to look at virtual reality stations, uh, which were included in this special exhibition here in Berlin. In the Humboldt Forum, the Ethnological Museum has in, in very interesting audio stations with individual cabins, where you can listen to details where um, uh, uh, literature, but also um, witnesses, for example, speak to you. And last but not least, you can bring in your pieces from your exhibition to your home via an Instagram augmented reality feature in the Metropolitan Museum of Art to your home. And I think this is a very interesting approach, how to bring in objects in a 3D manner. You scan them, you bring them um, uh, on a digital way from the online platform, but in your home so that you can then use them on an inter Instagram uh, channel. What we did, we asked our Agia members about their museum experience, like a museum experience survey, to share their personal experience, knowledge and expectations. We asked several questions, um, mapping the Arab and German perspectives, and it was targeted for contemporary inclusive participatory components to be fit for the future. And for us, this was very enlightening when we looked at the individual collections I was just referring to, and um, uh, members from Algeria, Egypt, Germany, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Morocco, Oman, Palestine, and Tunisia participated in this very survey. So several questions uh, were asked, sort of in which way um, different museum presentation formats are appealing, and the rate of the following presentation formats in this exhibition, uh, you know, are rated in, in uh, uh, a very detailed manner. So the highlights were looking at classical showcase exhibitions, walkable room installations, 3D models, 3D digital applications, virtual reality, augmented reality, experimental stations, and so forth. So the museum landscape is currently undergoing a transformation process. And for us, it was very enlightening to go to the Berlin Global Exhibition earlier on and to see how it's realized here in the Humboldt Forum. Visitors expect new and creative ideas, innovative concepts, and the integration of state-of-the-art technologies in the museum space. So the voices from the survey, just to pick out a couple, getting involved, getting in touch, being absorbed into the topic is very important and can be ideally realized in a mixed approach that combines interactive elements like augmented reality, experimental stations and the like. So the artistic interpretation of scientific concepts 
is here the focus. And I would like to mention that the concept that we developed out of this project, the concept for a future exhibition, including um, different presentation formats uh, from the 21st century, so new technologies, and we were um, able to con convey and we were able to convince the Museum Island that we will have an Agia exhibition in 2024 here in Berlin, and I'd like to use this opportunity to invite you all, and particularly you, Madam State Secretary, to come to this exhibition to see how Agia evolves, to see how the results of this project will develop. It will be about diversity in the ancient world from a diverse Agia community and Ahlan was Ahlan, and we very much look forward uh, to this exhibition. So thank you very much for the funding again. We are very pleased and happy about this. And um, with this, I would like to thank you all. It is my great pleasure now to introduce our panel, Berlin Global, Global Berlin which will be moderated by Julia Gerlach. She's a journalist and author. She's the founder of Amal Berlin. Amal is a news platform with local news from Berlin in Arabic and Darsi and Farsi. Before that, from 2008 to 2015, she worked as a correspondent for German media in Cairo. She is a political scientist and authored several books on Muslim youth movement in Germany and the Arab Spring. So I call now all panelists. This is Paul Spies, Felix Kreuzig, Fadi Abdel Nur, and Khadr El Beshaouri, and Julia to the floor. Thank you very much, and the floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay, then um, welcome again. Now we want to pick up the bits and pieces from the presentations, shake them and discuss about them and look at the different ways how Berlin is a global city, how Berlin is influencing developments, ideas, um, academia on a global sphere. Um, I think there are many different aspects that were risen now in those different presentations. And I'm very happy that we have this very diverse um, podium here to look at it from uh, very diverse perspectives. Hi, Fadi. <laughs> It wouldn't be a podium without you. We need your perspective. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for joining me. I would like to um, start to introduce my panelists. Um, I'm very happy that we have uh, Mr. Paul Spies here. He is the director of the Stadtmuseum Berlin and the chief curator of the Federal State of Berlin and the Humboldt Forum. We are happy to be your guest here. Um, thank you for letting us have a look at the museum. And um, Paul Spies was uh, or is an art historian. He has been working for many years. Um, he was in charge of the Amsterdam Museum Foundation. And in 2016, he came to Berlin. He became the director of the City Museum. And he also holds the position of the chief curator of the Humboldt Forum. Um, and thank you for having us in your house. And I would like to start also to introduce you a little more with a question before I'm introducing my other guests. Um, looking at this exhibition, I mean, 
in a way, a Stadtmuseum or a city museum. Normally, we see in those museums old stones. We learn about how the city is linked to its past. But here we learn something very different. Can you tell us a little bit about the process, how you got this concept of linking Berlin more to the outside world than to its past? Yes, um, love to do that. Um, First, I have to correct you a little bit. Um, I'm not the chief curator of the Humboldt Forum. I'm the chief curator for the city of Berlin or the land of Berlin in the Humboldt Forum. Okay. Uh, we're four partners in this building. Um, the Museum of Ethnology and Asian Art is one of those partners. We are one. Then the University of Berlin, Humboldt uh, University, is a third partner. And then there is this overall organization that um, bounces together with, um, um, for instance, also the history of the location and the exhibitions that are temporary. And um, uh, the city of Berlin has become, uh, has got, uh, got, got this uh, four and a half thousand square meters for the exhibition Berlin Global, because uh, the soil on which this building is standing, the building has been built by the Federal Republic of Germany, um, was given uh, for the um, for the occasion by the by the Land of Berlin, and as an exchange, they got this 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 you know this, these rooms for the exhibition. First, they thought they wanted to have a library here, and then uh, it changed when the new mayor came and said, "It's a museum building, so let's have an exhibition on Berlin." And then everybody said, "But we." do have already five museums on the Berlin history um, in one foundation, which is the Stiftung Stadtmuseum Berlin, the uh, foundation for the history museums of Berlin. So um, we have to be careful that uh, these museums, like the Märkisch Museum, are not cannibalized by, uh, uh, you know, this spot is, of course, an AAA location. and. Um, if you do anything, everything that is already done in other buildings uh, that are also of great importance, like the Merkish Museum, uh, you might um, you might make the others um, well, you know, n n not um, r um, of any importance anymore. So what we did when we started five years ago to think out the concept, we looked at the situation. We looked at where are we and. Um, uh, which partnership uh, can we offer to this building where the world cultures are central, in fact. So the Museum of Ethnology and the Museum of Asian Art, um, so to say the, the core of, the, of, the, of what, is, um, what is presented here. So we chose for uh, the world history of Berlin. Not the German history, not the Berlin history, but the world history of Berlin. So we looked at the connections um, Berlin has with the world. And of course, this is an, a, a huge amount of, of aspects. Um, so you have to choose um, a few of them to make clear what you think, uh, or what maybe also the audience thinks about what Berlin stands for and um, what happened to Berlin when the world came to Berlin to live here, to work here, to be part of the community. And how did Berlin then, in recent history, because we're not going back too far, we're going back till the moment the von Humboldt brothers, the building is called after these two famous scientists from, uh, from Germany, from Berlin, um, from the moment onwards where um, the uh, brothers were uh, involved in the society of Berlin, but also looking at the world. Um, Wilhelm was looking at uh, languages, um, he was looking at um, differences, but mostly he was also looking for um, uh, reminiscences. Um, he was also trying to see connections, like his brother, the more famous Alexander, who was also looking at um, the world in which he was trying to detect how everything was connected. Connections is the main issue of our exhibition. How is Berlin connected to the world? How are we connected to each other? And what the exhibition tries to do is to involve the, the, the visitors in thinking about their connections with the world, in their connections with other visitors. At the end, um, we try to connect the visitors who don't know each other to talk about one of the issues that are chosen for the exhibition. Um, and we have a interactive um, tour uh, that um, asks people to answer dilemmas 
we put them forward. And these dilemmas are of great, great interest to become part of the exhibition, to become part of the community that we are trying to make within the exhibition with the visitors. And in the end, we want people to be aware of their position if they go on in the building. So if they go up to the ethnological uh, collections, um, they have to think, what is my part in this? What do I want to say about this? What is my opinion about all this? How would I connect through these kinds of um, presentations with the, uh, with the world? Um, and the whole Humboldt Forum, in fact, is trying to become a center of connection. And uh, so the Berlin exhibition is trying to do its part to connect the building, the partners, Berlin with the, with the world and the visitors with each other. Thank you very much. Fadi Abdenour is my other next guest. Um, he, you have already seen, not Fadi, but what he's doing in the presentation of Hanan Badr. Uh, he is the owner and co-founder of uh, Hane Janoub Bookshop. And you all, if you live in Berlin, you all know his work as a designer because he is behind not only the Al Film Festival, but also behind those posters that you see once a year everywhere in the city um, announcing the Al Film Festival. Um, so I think you all have seen those nice posters before. Fadi, also for you, a first question to get to know you a little more. We saw your bookshop in the presentation on Arab Berlin. Um, would you say that Berlin, in fact, is an Arabic city by now? Um, Berlin is not an Arabic city, but um, Berlin, I mean, a lot of people would call Berlin the capital of Arab exile. So that is, I think, a more um, relative uh, answer to, to your question, um, if we can call the Berlin an Arabic city, because the Arab presence in Berlin is nowadays uh, visible everywhere. Um, it's present, people interact with it, but uh, this is a rather new um, situation. Um, when I came to Berlin 20 years ago, um, there was also Arabic presence in Berlin, but it was a different presence. It uh, was mainly, um, or most of the Arabs who lived in Berlin were refugees from the Lebanon war. So we would have um, societies who were marginalized before coming to Berlin and then ended up marginalized again in Berlin. Um, but the, what happened in the last 10 years, as Berlin more and more becoming the magnet city, which everybody is talking about, um, with the political situation in the Arab world, um, it attracted different Arabic migrants. Uh, so we ended up having a diverse Arabic society or communities in Berlin which um, interact with each other. They have uh, synergies, but also synergies with um, the, the rest of the cities, uh, the rest of the city's inhabitants, um, interaction with, with Germans, with internationals. Um, so this diverse Arabic uh, presence in Berlin made it possible for a lot of um, let's say cultural projects, artist projects, uh, but also social projects uh, made it possible for people to work in art, uh, to make projects like our bookstore. Actually, 20 years ago, such a project was Im not imaginable. Um, but nowadays, there is there's the community uh, that can, um, let's say, carry such projects and interact with it. Thank you very much. My next guest is um, the dear Dr. Shabel Beshraoui. He is the head of evidence-based public health unit of the Center of International Health Protection at the Robert Koch Institute. Welcome. Um, Dr. El Beshraoui, and you have a very long experience doing research in different uh, universities. You have been in the US doing research there. You have been doing studies in different parts of the world. And what is special about doing 
research in public health and global health here in Berlin? What is, uh, for an academic, what does it mean to be in Berlin? Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, great to meet you again. Julia, see you again. Uh, as you have helped in one of our research projects uh, earlier in the pandemic. Uh, so uh, I think it's important to mention to which extent Berlin is becoming this global place for global health. And it's becoming really a landmark in the domain. Global health means doing public health in international settings. And what public health is, is when you address factors that are not biological, environmental, environmental factors, cultural, social, uh, etc., but that affect our health. And so an easy example of public health, for example, maybe one that we can all recognize now is contact tracing. This is something we do when we ask you, who did you meet over the last few days, if you are, let's say, uh, COVID positive, to try to limit the spread of the infection. That's an easy example. And so when we take this to international settings, we call this global health. And uh, definitely Berlin is becoming this hub city for global health with uh, different initiatives, different activities, and also uh, different new places opening and attracting more and more of the human resources for global health. So we can talk a lot about this. This is just an introduction. Um, and this is, I think, what I will be talking about this evening in terms of how Berlin is becoming this landmark in global health. Thank you very much. I move to my next guest, last but not least, Professor Dr. Felix Kreuzig. He is the Chair of Sustainability Economics of Human Settlements at TU Berlin and the head of the working group Land Use, Infrastructures and Transport at Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change Berlin. You have a very long title. <laughs> nice to have you. Um, and before coming to Berlin, he was a postdoc fellow at the University of Berkeley and he holds a degree in, from the Cambridge University in the UK. Professor Kreuzig, you were part of one of the projects that we just learned about. And um, many projects in different parts of the world were presented. In what way can we learn from these? Or can you perhaps, perhaps you already have an example how Berlin picked up some of those ideas to, to make our life also a little bit easier? Yeah. Uh, so let, let me let me expand a little bit. Um, we had in the 20th century arguably two uh, global cities, two world cities, where world politics were made. It was Berlin and Jerusalem, and it was about geopolitical conflicts, territory, religion, and ideology. And unfortunately, we still have territorial conflicts, but cities are again in a global hotspot, and that is because we have now... Um, planetary challenge, climate change, and also other planetary challenges to solve the cities are deeply entangled. That relates to all cities, obviously, but like to give some specific examples, in Cairo, Africa's largest city, um, it's, uh, it's, it's expanding, and the question is where new settlements are built, because uh, um, Egypt has a very fertile land, the Nile Delta, but that's, of course, also needed for food production, and that's where each, um, Cairo is also located. And that intersects then with the geopolitical situation of high grain demand from Ukraine, for example. <coughs> um, like, what, what, uh, what, why are cities so important? Like, one part is health, actually. Health in a local setting, in a city setting, intersects with a planetary health perspective. And the key idea, the key point here what we're coming out I'm just I'm just walking out of the IPCC the intergovernmental panel on climate change and the key message is if we want to keep the planet stable we can't build any new fossil infrastructures and of course in Berlin we have one key example it's the new it's a highway extension a100 so we can't actually build that if we want to take it seriously at the same time Berlin is also a space where 
new solutions are coming up. It's, uh, for example, the pop-up pop bicycle lanes that are transforming the city. And again, cycling relates to health. We have an intersection in cities where climate solutions and health solutions are very close together and they're in a public domain, not in the individual domain. And that's what we're learning from. We're learning from Berlin, we're learning from Paris, and we're learning from all kinds of cities. And these solutions, of course, were urban solutions, local solutions intersect with the global solutions. So that's how it becomes global, because we have a global challenge and cities are part of that to solve it. Thank you. Um, I would like to pick up this and go back to Mr. Spies. As we heard from uh, Fadi also talking right after you, um, he was mentioning this new Arab culture coming up, exile communities, not only Arabic, but from many different uh, parts of the world. People are coming here. There's new cultural production. Um, can you give us the larger picture of this, perhaps, you even have examples in your exhibition um, how this, these elements are working together. Well, for one thing, um, Berlin, of course, ha has been a, a hub, a melting pot for, for many, many years. Um, uh, many cities in uh, the Western world have been that. Um, and you can, you can, I think, easily say that uh, the success of big cities um, comes from the newcomers. I mean, it doesn't take one or two generations um, that the influx of, of people from abroad, from other places, bring new ideas, new um, vitality or to a city. A city needs, so to say, the exchange and um, also the mixing up of all kinds of visions and backgrounds to become, you know, um, a development area for new ideas. And it's not always, I think, for the future on prosperity and on, on um, uh, uh, more and more. Uh, maybe we should think a little bit more about less is more, because um, economical growth has also been um, of uh, great damage to the, to the world. Um, I, I can recite uh, Alexander von Humboldt there, <laughs> who was the first to see um, uh, from uh, a scholarly perspective that climate change was changing everything, really. I mean, he saw what happened on the Orinoco River when um, uh, Spanish uh, farmers started to, um, um, to develop the jungle into um, uh, land for, for um, all kinds of crops. And, and he was the first to see that um, the, the connection there is that it, it, it has, has a whole chain of, of reactions. And um, I think this, in a city you have the possibility to connect, to meet people, um, to open up to all kinds of visions and knowledge. Uh, and I think that what, for instance, happens f from the Arabic world is uh, very comparable um, with what happens with all kinds of people. In the exhibition, uh, we chose um, as the Arabic um, influx um, an, an artist, an urban artist, Hannah El Degam, who was part of the revolution, of the uh, spring revolution in the Arabic countries, um, painting with the community. Um, uh, all kinds of um, graffiti art um, that was uh, trying to uh, open up uh, to a new age, to a new movement. Um, we know what happened to the revolution and she had to, uh, to, to, to go to, to, to Berlin where she connected with activists from all kinds of countries, not just from Arabic countries, but from all kinds of uh, countries. She invited them uh, for her huge piece of art. She has painted um, two sides of um, uh, f uh, walls, um, four meters by eight meters, in which she um, depicts the situation of the world and, th and th tries to think what think what are the next uh, what what are the reasons for a next revolution so um, and and she picks up also things from her own history from her own country brings them in the painting but uh, she mixes it up with um, all kinds of um, opinions from others so that you have two walls because she has invited uh, activists to write down their sayings their their ideas on the next revolution on the reasons for revolutions for the for the next uh, uh, era um, as, so she, she in fact binds all kinds of visions and, view, uh, and views viewpoints in her art, work of art so um, I, I, she is opening up 
to the whole world in her new place where she's a, which is a safe haven uh, for for her life and for her work um, and, and and opening up to others um, with with their opinions so that as visitor you get in, in fact a whole uh, um, perspective of a whole range of perspectives on on how on how you um, you could could see this time and and try to 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 think about the, the more important and and maybe also um, dangerous aspects of what is happening in the world today so the the, 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 the people from outside, like Arabic um, uh, immigrants, bring in an, an influx of ideas, um, uh, an, uh, an also a new form of discussing, um, and, and their knowledge from their own backgrounds, which um, makes uh, a city a hub in which people also meet because we cannot do this everything we can't do everything online we cannot do it by um, abstract forms we also have to meet if you want to open up you um, uh, for, for for international knowledge you have also you need these meetings like today uh, in which you uh, really get connected because the connection is also a personal connection and um, therefore um, I, I think it's very important that um, museums like the Humboldt Forum tries to be a platform for um, meeting up for connections um, and, and, and for um, combinations of knowledge uh, that bring us uh, forward into a more diverse vision of what the world is um, and the exhibition also tries to leave out a little bit of the mainstream knowledge on the history of Berlin and to bring up um, many more perspectives on the same issues that are from a different angle. Um, because the different angle, the other angle, makes um, you think much more on, on, on the reality um, and, and you get new um, visions on your so-called knowledge which um, has um, been influenced by generations of bringing the same knowledge forward. So by having different people looking from a different angle, you get new visions on the same aspect which enriches your viewpoint. Yes, it might be complicated, but please embrace the complication and don't make it simple like the populists do. So the exhibition in, in, in fact is trying to be a popular exhibition against populism embrace complexity but meet people because this complexity is an enrichment uh, in itself for every individual in our society so it's a museum without being a museum <laughs> thank you um you were talking about mixing um, influences, bringing together different influences from different parts of the world. Fadi, looking at your posters, looking at this Al Berlin, Al Film uh, movement, if I may call it a movement, but or a phenomena or groups or festivals, whatever, looking at your bookstore, it's also a new kind of mixture of Arab uh, influences of different Arab countries, of um, perhaps also a little bit of Berlin style in it. Can you describe this phenomena of um, Al Film, Al Berlin? It's a new thing coming up. It's not uh, the millennium uh, Arabic scene that we used to know um, years ago. From Berlin, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as as we just heard, it's um, new people coming in, uh, bring on with them their own experiences and interaction with the city. Um, this uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go um, that far to say things are for Arabs people or Arabic people in Berlin. Um, things are defined already. It's it's a process. Um, um, I think it will it will uh, flourish more and, and get more vivid. Um, but but there is a couple of things which happened in Berlin, which w created a lot of synergy between different Arabic, let's say, communities living in Berlin. Um, with the political situation in the Arabic world in the last 20, 30 years exchange between Arabic countries in a lot of sectors, um, especially in the non-official sectors, let's say, um, the free scenes, art, culture, was not that easy. 
Um, it costed a lot of money. There were no um, exchange projects like we see in Europe uh, who emphasize on, on exchange ETC. And then um, all of these people came to Berlin by choice. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people had uh, chosen Berlin because they already heard about Berlin. They have a decision that uh, lifestyle in Berlin, the vivid city fits them. So sometimes I look at people, I think uh, they have been Berliners their whole life. Uh, because they just um, f fit perfectly in the city, interact perfectly in the city. They, um, I'm trying to avoid integrate perfectly in the city, but uh, <laughs> um, so this this interaction between all of these um, communities who also had different migration experiences. Um, my migration experience is different from a Syrian. Um, who came to Berlin uh, directly, or a Syrian who came um, or landed in, in, in uh, Munich, for example, and then decided, okay, it doesn't fit me good here, I, I want to go to Berlin, or somebody from Egypt who um, um, just got here uh, three years ago, um, and Berlin gives all of these communities um, the possibility that they interact with each other, which in, in, in ways that wasn't possible before. Um, but, but also nowadays with, with social media, it's, uh, migrating is different than migrating 100 years ago. So you will migrate, but then at the same time, um, you're connected very much to what's happening in, in, in the country you migrated from. So you're living here, but also worrying about the problems back home, the daily problems even, not, not the things you hear in the news. Um, connecting on a daily basis with, with friends and sharing their experiences. Um, and, and this synergy, which happens in the city, also reflects on, on other communities back home, ETC. Um, so in, in that sense, I think there is this, there is a possibility, not possibility. Um, in, in some years, we will have this special, let's say, um, um, Arabic Berlin identity, for example. If, I don't know if, if it makes sense, but uh, let's say Italian New York identity, if that uh, rings a bell. So something like that, where, where, where you have an Arabic identity which is very special, it is, um, it is affected by, by Cairo, by Beirut, by Ramallah, by uh, Morocco, Tunisia, and at the same time it's very Berlin. I remember once I had a Deutsche Döner in uh, Cairo, which was sold there as a speciality on the street. Um, it, is there something like this to be felt already that uh, this uh, Arab Berlin is um, influencing the culture and or the intellectual discourse in Arab countries as well? Um. <laughs> I mean, just now there is a concert in, in um, will be starting in um, half an hour or something from a musician from Pal he's a Palestinian musician and uh, a poet, uh, also Palestinian, and they had this album and they're making a tour now, now they're in Berlin, and their album is called uh, More Beautiful Than Berlin. And it was actually... <laughs> Um, everybody, I mean, uh, last year when it came out, it was um, everybody was talking about it in social media. I mean, it's not it's not uh, pop music, so it's it has its own um, it has its own audience. Um, yeah, so this is maybe um, one example, and there are people who just uh, were offended by the name of the of, of the album and uh, what is all of these people talking about Berlin I, we can't stand it anymore it's um, yeah <laughs> no we wouldn't be offended <laughs> thank you
Dr. Elbesch Rawi. So moving to more serious topics of global health, and you already mentioned the pandemics. Um, Fadi was just talking about developments, how the city also has changed through migration. I think migration is one of the factors that really changed the city. Um, climate change is another one. But I think looking at the last two years, the pandemics has also really changed um, the city, the way we are living. If you look ahead into the future, would you say that it is more the lockdown that is influencing us, that we were closing down, we were all staying home, we were not traveling? On the other hand, uh, we had all this, I mean, it was very obvious that we are interconnected, that we are very much influenced by developments all over the world, by global health, as you mentioned. What is your prediction or what is your take on this? So for us, specifically in our field, obviously the lockdown, in fact, or the pandemic has put us in the spotlight. Uh, it did not, in fact, bring us down. It's the complete opposite. And so this is what I wanted to talk about in terms of what is happening in Berlin uh, that is really making Berlin now this landmark, uh, and that is global health. So if we just think a little historically, what has been the involvement of Germany uh, in terms of just, let's just say, health in the global settings? And up to 2014 or 2015, really Germany's involvement was mostly in terms of development assistance. And this is uh, usually giving financial assistance to countries to improve their health infrastructure or anything, but not the public health that I was referring to. And maybe you all remember that in 2014 and 2015, there was this major epidemic of Ebola. And this is what triggered this uh, new kind of thinking in Germany on the political agenda in terms of we can't just only be here and just be giving financial assistance. We have to be involved in terms of how to basically protect health internationally, not just by sitting here, but also by working with the countries. And this is what pushed this uh, move into putting international health protection, which is one domain of global health, on the political agenda uh, in Germany. And naturally, the first place for this to start is to create this department in which I work, which is the Center for International Health Protection, obviously at the Robert Koch Institute, and this is in Berlin. And this is not a simple thing for Berlin because, um, interestingly enough, barely a year through the pandemic, excuse me, barely a year when we were created then, we're immediately thrown into a pandemic. And the pandemic literally started barely three months after I moved to Germany for this position. And usually you would think, you know, for, for RKI and for the Center for International Health Protection as a new player, you would think no one is going to basically care about us. You'd be impressed by the number of countries that specifically requested German assistance in terms of controlling the pandemic, uh, from the Robert Koch Institute and specifically uh, from us as a new department. And so uh, we've been forged in, I think, the battle as a department. And this was not the only initiative that was happening in Berlin. One thing we've learned because of the pandemic is that we're not safe by just sitting you know, in our homes and waiting for something to happen somewhere. And this also led to a new initiative that's strongly driven by Germany. And its center is in here in Berlin. This is the WHO hub for epidemic and pandemic um, prediction or preparedness. And what this is, this is a major initiative that started also in last September that will be creating this major hub in Berlin uh, this major artificial intelligence-based center that will be focusing on making accessible, available health and non-health data that can be very quickly analyzed to be able to predict threats and pandemics and epidemics anywhere and be able to take action immediately. And this is something 
that is also major for Berlin. And what do these two initiatives mean for Berlin globally? It means this first attraction of human resources, but also building human resources here in Berlin. And this is one of, uh, so in the unit I lead, uh, in our strategy building or developing human resources for international health is one part of the strategy and this is what we try to do. And so we also observe this major attraction to Berlin of international students coming to in fact get uh, higher education, specifically graduate education or postgraduate education in international health. For me, this is a major change for the city in terms of where it's put in it on the you know, world map for this domain that was very usually restricted to the United States and to a certain extent the UK. And now Germany specifically, it's a coincidence that the pandemic happened you know, when our department was still new, but it really gave us this push as the world starts looking at Germany as this major player, specifically Berlin as a major player in global health. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, looking one step further, um, talking about transportation, mobility, we already talked about the question how and what kind of examples you picked up or are already picked up from uh, the experience of other countries to be implemented in Berlin. Um, perhaps you can talk now about the Berlin example being exported to other countries. Thinking about Berlin and transportation, looking with the eyes of somebody from abroad, I would think about everybody driving their Lastenfahrrad and you have um, lanes for bicycles everywhere. But if you try to take this example to other cities, um, it's not really, you can't really imagine how this can be implemented. For example, when we saw the picture of the bicycle lane on the highway in Cairo, it looks a little bit dangerous, I would say. But how is, um, what are we exporting and what are the ideas that are being picked up by other countries? Well, the transfer of ideas is, of, and is of course in both directions. So Berlin can also learn a lot from, from other countries and other continents. It's first of all very clear. So um, I think first of all the institutional dimension that we also just heard also in this case is very important. Um, I'm a scientific director of a new institute, institute, the Einstein Center Climate Change, which is really focused on cities in their global role. The case study is always Berlin and the uh, surrounding region of Brandenburg. But the question is we are really what can we do in the next 10 years to uh, have public policies and climate change mitigation in cities with Berlin and the, at the key case here. <clears throat> so what, we, what can we learn? Um, uh, and like uh, basically like with the, there's as we have to start, I mean like there's so many aspects to talk about, but like take one out here. Um, yeah, the uh, automobile is an extremely inefficient uh, mode of transportation. So usually like in average 1.1 person, so 100 kilograms is transported in two tons of steel. And um, the uh, energy, the motor is actually also a very inefficient one. Usually 20 to 25 percent of the energy is used for transportation. And <clears throat> um, there are two different ways of to think about it. Uh, one, of course, is like public transportation. Another one is the cycling. Both of them much more efficient. But of course, we also need flexible motorized transportation. And the key idea is that for one uh, motorized vehicle, you don't have one passenger, but like four passengers. And that is like shared pool mobility, it's uh, Sammeltaxis, it's in, in Berlin, it's Bergkönig, it's Clever Shuttle. And of course, it's an idea that has for long been implemented, for example, in Cairo, in, uh, for example, in many Indian cities, like the collective transport that's really like just picking up uh, people on the route. It sometimes it's born out of necessity, but it's also highly efficient. And this is like to some degree and connected with smart mobility in terms of like the smart routing, very efficient routing by apps, like one of the futures that Berlin might take or not. <laughs> so it's of course subject to political discussion. Um, uh, but that's, that's uh, one important direction where Berlin can also learn from other parts of the world. Um, if I may, I would like, we have a little bit like two way discussions here. One is much more on the cosmopolitan Berlin, on the cultural dimension, and here we are 
more on like the political role of health and climate change and i would like to make a soft connection it's not 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 a very operationist one but um <laughs> there, i mean of course if you go to mobility if you go to he public health practices like food um like there's immediate connection because like of course the way we move the way we eat they're much very much culturally embedded uh, and they also have huge impacts on the health dimension on the climate dimension um, but there's even one more subtle aspect here. We're talking about the cosmopolitan Berlin, like how different cultures are uh, in the city and, and, and find their way in the city and interact with each other. And there's, <coughs> there's in, in an international discussion on this, there are two poles, the cosmopolitan pole and the uh, localized pole that stays there and that is identified with belonging, some by sometimes going in a very wrong way. But what I loved also about the book presentation that we heard is the cosmopolitan Berlin can be related to the place-based belonging aspect. And I think that's a very important aspect. We need cosmopolitan ideas because we have the global problems and we are globally connected in many different ways. And we also need to have the feeling of belonging to a place because that's, of course, where we also find solutions of interactions. And I, that's, I think that the, the idea of connectedness that you are talking about, both to the global perspective and by the different cultures that are in the city and to the place itself is really important at the end also for health solutions and for climate solutions. Yeah, thank you very much. Before I ask you to answer to this, um, I would like to invite you as well, if you have questions, if you um, want to raise your hand, please, and um, perhaps you could just briefly introduce yourself, say your name and your affiliation. We have some a possibility to take some questions um, for our dear guests here on the panel. Um, but I think the soft connection was... Um, is there anybody who has a question right now? Otherwise, we would continue and you just raise your hand and... Think about it. Um, so, I, Mr. Spies, I would like to ask you to react to this. I think the uh, bridge, the soft connection, as uh, he said, was built towards you. Um, what role does the transportation play oh, yes. in all this? Yeah. But um, by the way, we have in the exhibition now um, an, um, a part on um, subculture cycling. It's called uh, Easy Rider Roadshow. <laughs> it's a, a, a brief um, part um, to introduce an exhibition. It's now in the Merkisch Museum, which is the, the bigger, um, say, historical museum that we uh, have in our group. Um, I, I think uh, the, the exhibition tries to, to show that there are uh, international connections of communities that we don't know about. <laughs> There are cyclist um, connections all over the world. Um, personally, I'm from Holland. I'm a, a cyclist. I do everything on my bike in, in this city. Um, and I, I, I do believe that um, everything is interconnected. Again, <laughs> Alexander von Humboldt who has said, you know, anything you do has a result, has, a, has, has, has a, an effect on, on it's something else, but also on others. So it matters what you think, what you say, what you do. You have to be very conscious of that anything you do, like driving a car, uh, has a lot of um, effect on, on, on everything, on, on people. I, I, by the way, I, I, in one of the introductions, suddenly I, 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 I had this realization that um, if you drive a car, um, you're 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 having yourself you know isolated within the community um using um the the the, the, the cityscape um to transport yourself and nobody else <laughs> um to get um from a to b uh, which is in many um i think uh in many ways the wrong thing to do Actually, I mean, it, 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 you've just explained a lot about um, what what happens when you drive a car in in, in a city. Um, um, I, I think that the, the connection we can make is that um, the cultural institutions try to um, take over, um, um, learn from all these kinds of 
internationally um, renowned and important um, scholarly approaches and bring them to the people <laughs> because you have you need this transfer from you know knowledge to um, a, a, a huge audience and not just say the higher educated people um, uh, what we can learn from that and how we can um, improve our, our community um, and I think the Humboldt Forum also has a role there for, for the city and of course for the world because we're so much interconnected um, with the world but um, that we, we try to translate to be an institution that, that helps to get these you know very um, advanced perspectives as quickly as possible further to a huge audience and for that we also need um, new methods to connect um, because museums are buildings that are not co connecting everybody it's it is it is of course the the institution that has always been um, there for um, people that, with interest with a little bit of education and also with time um, and of course with uh, um, some background that has introduced them to this, this, this um, the, in, so what we're also looking for is different approaches with different ways of um, presenting for new groups that might be interested and this is also what the exhibitions try to do and I hope that the Humboldt Forum can also um, go along this way is to uh, broaden the group of interested people uh, to broaden people that participate in the city because it's all about you know being part of the community and um, not being part of uh, an, an isolated uh, personality that is um, trying to cope with the city and um, uh, yeah I, 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 I just can say that we tried in the exhibition to open up with many different ways um, experimenting um, how we can reach out to people that are not used to visiting museums and to um, who want to be interested by their form of um, cultural background. So, and this is what we're trying to do here too: um, invite um, people um, with their own background in their own language and um, telling that to different people that are not known to these languages and make connections there. So, um, it, it should be a constant opening up new ways of new voices and what we have to get rid of is this um, um, you know this repetition of always the same like driving the car we have to get rid of the idea that has you know stuck into our heads because generations of fathers have been learning me the son to drive a car to possess a car and, and you know how do you get rid of those cliches so the exhibition is trying to look at the cliches of Berlin and question them, them. Like, is this true? Is this the best way? Is this the, is the mainstream that what we want? Or do we want to look at different ways so that we can save this world? In the end, that's everything that we have to be. Um, I, I think this is the main task we have. Every researcher should be participating, not in just, you know, new ways to become bigger, faster and richer, but in saving this world. It's all about that, I think. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite you again, if there are any questions or remarks from you. I'm sorry, we can't take any questions from those people following this uh, session online, but take your chances here, your privilege of being here in the room. Then I would like to... Hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Verena Lepper is my name from Akia. Um, Paul Spies already started this, but uh, you all, all panelists, described from your standpoint where, you know, Berlin stands, uh, where the experiences came from in a global context. But if we look in the future, what kind of vision would you have? What kind of expectations, but also what kind of wishes would you have where Berlin in a global context should develop into? Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, so 
Yeah, please. Yeah. So thank you for the question, Verena. For me, uh, I wouldn't call it a vision because I live it every day. And for us, this is an obvious like train that's already departed. Uh, or a ship that's already sailed. And I do think that Berlin will become further this global health hub uh, in Germany. Um, and I do hope it continues. Uh, I Personally, I feel I'm part of the people who are planting the seed. Uh, since I, I had the chance or the opportunity to create one of the department's units and uh, to set it, you know, to set the road for it. So it feels like, you know, I am contributing not just at the institution level, but also at the city level by making or attracting, you know, this attention to, to Berlin. Uh, I, uh, so I, obviously I'm, I'll let uh, also uh, my colleagues respond, but I'm gonna maybe make some of you happy. So uh, I've been driving since I was 18 or 19 a car in Lebanon, later in France, later in the States. And when I came here, obviously the first thing I did is to get a car. And then the peer pressure from everyone I work with since November, I just decided, okay, <laughs> no more driving. <laughs> and now I use the public transit, but I'm yet to learn how to bike. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I would hand over to you. <laughs> Perhaps you also want to contribute either to this topic or to the vision of Berlin. Uh, yeah, vision of Berlin is uh, interesting. Uh, of course, there's a localized version, which is um, um, it's, 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 it's the funny thing is like like when we talk about the change, it's often framed as a, as a change that costs us so much, but there's also so much to gain. And as, uh, Berlin can be an example. So um, it can be, <clears throat> like of course a, a bicycle city, we have other examples from Amsterdam, Copenhagen, etc. It can be an, uh, a city of efficient uh, collective uh, shared pool mobility. Um, it has the ideal uh, preconditions. Berlin is fantastic because it's a based, built on villages, right, that are connected by train already, like it has a perfect layout, like if you would dream as a city urban planner about a city, you would build Berlin, basically. It has, has a really, really perfect preconditions. Um, and then it's a question of the global connectedness. And one of the issues, and that makes it difficult, aviation is really not the best way. Like it's most unequally distributed of CO2 emissions and it's really a, a big problem. So um, the future in that way uh, is train-based. And then like you can think about like train connections into the world. And um, it's uh, interesting how to connect to the Arab world because there's a train connection to Istanbul, right? You can go in two days from here to Istanbul. But if you go to uh, Aleppo, um, you have to take a bus, right? There's no train anymore. So like thinking about uh, building a further train connection, uh, again, that, uh, that could be a very specific vision here. Thank you very much. So we learned about your bike experience and your bike experience. What about your bike experience and what about your vision of uh, Berlin and the future and how it's going to be connected to the world? Um, my bike experience. Um, I actually uh, have a Lusten, um, but which I don't drive in winter. So, to be honest, <laughs> I. What do you use it for then? Um, I use it in summer for everything, mm -hmm. but in, in the cold months, um, I'm back to car or public transportation. It's, uh, I'm not in that sense, I'm not that Berliner. Um, so, I will. Um, Maybe uh, connect on 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 what uh, you were saying. Uh, it's I, I couldn't when when you're talking about your dream of connecting to the Arab world with train. I, I just couldn't um, not think about a hundred years later. <laughs> some German is trying to connect Istanbul to the rest of the Arab world with train. Um, so it, it seems like the story is uh, um, <laughs> um, so which which brings me to um, I don't know if I if it's a vision but maybe it's a wish um, there's there's a lot which happened in Berlin in the last five ten years 
um, a lot also in, uh, which was very, very positive if we compare that with other cities in the cultural sector and the uh, diversity uh, issues, etc, etc. Um, but still there is, there is much to do. I mean, if, um, if Burger King is capable of targeting an ad on, in Arabic, to me, on Facebook, with proper Arabic, but an ad that wants me to work at Burger King. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, sometimes um, the authorities in Berlin, for example, in the epidemic, were not capable of, of really uh, putting important information in proper Arabic that people can understand. Um, so, so there's, there's, I mean, there's a, even here in, 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 in Humboldt Forum, I mean, last year images circulated uh, with this uh, Arabic script, which was not readable, uh, put on, on walls and ETC. Um, I mean, everybody's talking about diversity. Uh, b b everyone is praising peer pressure. Uh, everyone likes and loves diversity, wants things to be diverse as much as possible, but most of the time, through my experience with, um, let's say, public and even, um, even funders, organizations in culture and social organizations as well, I feel this, this diversity is, um, is very much conditioned, very much conditioned to just fit in, in a German homogeny. You know, it's like um, it's, it's like we want everything to be diverse, but the way we like it. I mean, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's either you want them diverse, even if you don't like them, or you just say, "Okay, that's it. I want things to be that way." Um, I don't know if if that counts as a vision. I think that is a good keyword for you. Um, is that something that you would describe as typical Berlin? I mean, it's something many people are complaining about, um, that there's this one vision or this uh, pattern where you should fit in. Is that something that is perhaps also reflecting, uh, reflected in the exhibition? And, and I think we are moving from the idea of integration to diversity, but we still have to learn how diversity really works. And it's, it's complicated because, like, for instance, we have um, 10 languages in, for the exhibition on a device. Arabic is one of the languages, by the way. And the device doesn't work. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, I cannot offer you it today. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, something we're just having bad luck. So we've got the, the languages of Berlin that are most, um, if, um, you know, presented in the population. So we've got Turkish and Arabic, we've got uh, uh, Chinese and, um, of course, then some European languages. Polish, of, of which uh, is very important because it's a huge Polish community. And then we've got, of course, um, uh, simple um, uh, uh, language that is uh, einfach, simple language, uh, German for, for certain people, and also Gebärdensprache. So, um, um, what, do you, what do you call that in, in English um, for blind people? Uh, sorry, for uh, pe um, people that can't hear. And 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 it's and it's very important to have all kinds of. Um, um, you know, opening up for the many diverse communities you have. Um, but it, it takes time, it, 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 it costs a little, and you have to organize it. And um, it, 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 I think we're learning, because if I compare this to, uh, I'm, I'm, in, uh, I'm in the trade of museum making now for about 30 years, or 35 years even. Um, it started with you know, being proud on having an English version of your a, a Dutch, in this case, Dutch exhibition. Um, that is by far not enough anymore. So, yes, you have to say every time, listen, um, uh, you want uh, us to be part of the diverse city, city. For us, it's important that we can keep those aspects of our own community, of our own, um, um, from our, our own backgrounds, to, to stay a little bit um, uh, diverse. And, 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 and it's a dance. It's a dance between 
being here and, and doing as the Romans do, as they say. And on the other hand, if we want, biolog um, uh, if we want a biological diversity, we also want human diversity. And you have to keep that um, in, in good shape. Um, Again, uh, uh, one von, von Humboldt, Wilhelm von Humboldt, was, was trying really to work on the differences, the differences of languages to, to respect them. So um, respect is the, the first thing, um, listening, opening up to um, what diversity really brings you. And then, you know, from that, maybe there comes a, an integration from the other side. We're taking over special aspects of, for instance, Ar Arabic culture. But I don't think many people are really open for that yet. Um, so this, this is a, a process of learning. But uh, if I may say for the future that you know true diversity is opening up to very much and and um, ha having being influenced as people from the West by people from all over the world instead that you turn it around. And maybe that's also one aspect that will save the world. Thank you very much. I like this idea that for talking respect, you don't need a device and it can't be broken. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Paul Spies, Fadi Abdenur, Shabel Beschraui, Herr Kreuzing, uh, Kreuzig, sorry. <laughs> um, Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you for those people following us on YouTube and on social media. Thank you very much for tonight. I think if you have questions coming up now, there's still the chance to try to catch one of the panelists and ask your question directly. Um, thank you for tonight and enjoy the evening.